Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second Third Coast Water Seminar uh, presented by Northwestern, the University of Illinois, Argonne National Lab, University of Illinois at Chicago, the University of Chicago, and current Chicago's Water Innovation Hub. We're excited to have you all here today for a lecture on the next generation of desalination membranes. Where are we now? And I'm just gonna walk through some logistics really quickly. Um, this webinar is being recorded. So the link will be shared on Current's event page and sent to all attendees post-event. Please, as a reminder, submit your questions in the Q&A tab, not the chat. The Q&A tab is what we'll be monitoring uh, for questions for our speaker. And we wanna make sure you're thinking of them throughout the presentation. So anytime you have one, please submit it. We'll be taking questions at the end. A brief agenda. Our Third Coast Water Seminar series always feature uh, one of our distinguished speakers from the water research community. Um, and you'll be hearing from him following a brief introdu introduction from Aaron Packman, the director of Northwestern Center for Water Research and professor of civil and environmental engineering in the McCormick School of Engineering. Why are we here? So everyone's come together today motivated by a shared purpose. We all care about water and using the best talent, tools, and capacities we have to find solutions to the world's pressing water challenges. We're here because we need more healthy water to drink and less flood water in our basements. And Current is a convener of unbiased advocates for the best water solutions and policies. Our job is to stay on top of the latest in water tech, knowing that this field is rapidly changing all around us. We help to independently assess those technologies and we recommend the best solutions for others to try or for us to pilot. We do this because we think that innovative approaches to water solutions are often too big or too complicated for one single company, organization, or individual to tackle on their own. And we think they always require collaboration. So that's why Current builds partnerships among individuals, government, nonprofits, businesses, and especially here at the Third Coast Water Seminar, the research community, who are willing to take rational risks and try out new solutions. So the Third Coast Water Seminar Series was born out of these, these challenges and the sense of a collaborative research community coming together based here in Chicago and in Illinois to solve them. And we're very excited today uh, to be hearing from a distinguished speaker. And I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Aaron Packman, uh, to introduce him. So Aaron, over to you. Thank you, Elena. Yes, I'm Aaron Packman. I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering and the director of the Center for Water Research at Northwestern University. I am very pleased today to be the host of our speaker, Manny Alamalek. Manny is the Roberto Gozueta Professor in the Department of Chemical and Environmental Engineering at Yale. His research focuses on membrane-based technologies for the water energy nexus, materials for next generation uh, desalination and water purification, and environmental applications of nanomaterials. Manny has received numerous awards for his research contributions over the last 30 years. He's a member of the US National Academy of Engineering. He was awarded the Clark Prize for Excellence in Water Research, the Any Prize for Protection of the Environment, and was also elected to the Chinese Academy of Engineering. Manny has advised a very large number of PhD students and postdocs, many of whom are leaders and some of whom we'll hear from um, in future Third Coast Water Seminars. Many has also received numerous awards in recognition of his teaching and mentoring, including the Keck Foundation Engineering Teaching Excellence Award, the Yale University Graduate Mentoring Award, and the Yale University Postdoctoral Mentoring Prize. And I'm very happy to turn it over to many and hear about cutting edge technologies in membranes. Thank you so much, Aaron, for this introduction. And let me share the screen. Okay. Just a second, I need to move your picture here. Okay. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to give this presentation. Just let me one second to arrange all my screen is all these three monitors. You can never find yourself sometimes. So anyway, so just a second here. Okay, great. So I will talk today about uh, desalination membrane and with the sort of the question, where are we now? And let's start with, let's see, does it move here? Okay, good. So water scarcity is a global concern. We all know about it. And 4 billion people face severe water scarcity more than one month a year. 
and half billion uh, face uh, water scarcity all year round. So when you look at such maps, there are many maps for water scarcity, but this is just one example. Uh, the darker the color, the more water stress. And this map is quite deceiving because if you look at some countries, let's look at the United States, you see that it, we tell you that it's med medium to high stress. Indeed, what we really need to look is really at the heterogeneity and the variability within each country. And let's look at the United States and you see that although on average, I mean, the situation is not as bad, but if you look at some location, especially the Southwest, the situation is really not good. And again, you can think about some places that you have plenty of water and some places, places with no water, but it will not be economical to transfer water all the way from the East Coast to the West Coast. So we've seen a lot of maps. And again, I'll show you maps from the New York Times. Because again, it's not the COVID-19 map that all of you look at the New York Times, but you can look here at the water scarcity. Again, extreme high dark color. And this is uh, the year 220. Let's see, I'll find the laser. So this is the year 220. Now pay attention to the change of color. The projection for two, 2030, again, I'm going back to 20, I mean, uh, 220, 2030, and 2040. So again, we expect this uh, water scarcity to increase as time progresses. So we all heard about uh, Cape Town that almost, almost run, ran out of water. And soon after it, uh, the BBC had an article about 11 cities that potentially can run out of water. And again, when you look at this list, you'll see quite surprising cities that you will never imagine because they are very close to water. But again, it's not because of lack of water physically, it's also lack of water management, water quality, and all of these can contribute to the fact that they can run out of water. And talking about water management, a city that really ran out of water, just again, again from the BBC last year, the city of Chennai, the former Madras, all the reservoirs ran out of water and they completely, I mean, ran out of water because they did not do the right management. Those of you who know some geography, Chennai is close to the coast. In principle, they could have thought about building some desalination plant, but they have not done it. So, so bring, this brings me to desalination. Uh, and again, desalination is a way to augment water supply. And again, we can increase water supply by using unconventional water sources that you will never, again, at least 20 years ago, we would never think about them, like reuse of municipal wastewaters and of course, desalination of seawaters. So this will be the focus of my talk and soon you'll see where the membranes uh, come in. So let's say, uh, talk about desalination of those who are not familiar. Again, reverse osmosis is really the gold standard technologies, although you can hear and read in the literature some other technologies, no one can come even close to reverse osmosis. So this is really the gold standard. And roughly it works by taking a water from the ocean by intake, pre-treating it the same way that you treat water for drinking water. And then you go to the reverse osmosis stage that does the separation of water and salt. We go after it to post uh, treatment that you add some minerals to the water so they will have the right taste, maybe remove some other species. And of course, we also produce some brine that you discharge to the ocean. And this is roughly the lines that you see here will give you an idea about the energy consumption. The thicker the line, the more energy consumption, and most of the energy will be consumed by the reverse osmosis stage that you see here. Now, uh, I'll give you an example of a country that really planned ahead, Israel. And again, they built five major desalination plants. I mean, that you see here, all along a coast and no more than 150 kilometers. So along 150 kilometers or less, they built these five huge desalination plants. Again, 85, and this one can go to 100 million gallons per day. And just to put everything in perspective, you all know that uh, uh, in San Diego, they built a desalination plant in Carlsbad next to San Diego. And although it took, it took them 12 years to decide about it because of environmental concerns, this plant is only 50 million gallons per day. So just look at each one of them. It's smaller than any of these plants here. We can also use, uh, again, uh, wastewater as a way to uh, augment water supply. And this is a advanced membrane technology scheme to treat wastewater. This is the wastewater uh, treatment plant. In the past, they were treating the wastewater 
and dumping it into the ocean. This is in California, I think Fountain Valley. And what they're doing now, they are going through some pretreatment by microfiltration, reverse osmosis that I mentioned earlier, advanced oxidation, and then they produce water of drinking water quality that in principle you can drink, but of course we do not do direct portable use. So what they do in this plant in Orange County, California, uh, again, it's 100 million gallons per day, it's huge. They inject the treated wastewater by treated by this scheme to the groundwater that eventually is used as a drinking water supply for Orange County. So this is what we call indirect portable use uh, for water. Now, here where the membranes come into play, membranes play a key role in these two processes. Let's go to the previous process, the wastewater reuse. The key is really the reverse osmosis membrane that removes some salt, contaminants, and eventually we need some advanced oxidation because there are some contaminants that leaking through the membrane. So this is the reverse osmosis membrane. And when you go to the seawater desalination plant, this is the scheme that I showed you. The reverse osmosis stage is the stage that utilizing reverse osmosis membrane for desalination. So again, they are used for seawater desalination or wastewater reuse for the same purpose of desalinating and removing a lot of uh, dissolved solids. So let's now talk about this reverse osmosis membrane. Again the, again, the gold standard for reverse osmosis membrane is the polyamide, thin film composite polyamide reverse osmosis membrane that was again developed in the late 70s. Uh, and since then, no one was able to uh, produce a membrane which better performance of this membrane. So again, there are a lot of research, very extensive research, I mean, hundreds of papers, but still this is the membrane that to beat. And again, it's done by interfacial polymerization of two monomers on an interface of a aqueous and organic solvent, and you form a very thin film and this thin film provides you the right permeability, water permeability, and the right salt rejection. And this is why it makes reverse osmosis such a powerful and useful technology. So now I would like to go and talk about the next generation membranes. Again, polyamide is the one to beat. This is the current membrane. It's a good one. It's not easy to beat and you'll see very soon. And uh, let's talk about the evolution of research in next generation membrane, which will also will be the structure of my uh, talk. The first stage of research to really have a membrane that better than the polyamide was, a, again, between 2006 to about 2014. Uh, and this is a research to produce ultra high flux membrane, membrane that can pass a lot of water in a short time. And, and again, there was a lot of papers uh, published in this area and eventually the research stopped because I will show you soon that probably they found it will not help a lot in desalination. It's good for very nice papers, very fundamental research, but it will not change the desalination landscape in terms of energy. The second stage of research roughly from the 2012 until now is really to have a membrane with a ultra high water salt selectivity. In other words, membrane that can have much, much higher salt rejection or higher salt rejection than the current polyamide, which is roughly, again, the current polyamide removes salt at a rate of 99.9% .9 and even more. And later, and I think what will be the next uh, future research, and again, we have just published a perspective article about it. And this is really to design some smart membrane that can achieve ion-ion selectivity, although maybe it's not directly related to desalination, but it can be part of the desalination scheme. And as I said, I will uh, arrange in uh, my talk around this three topic, water permeability, it will be very short, because again, we, I think most people know about it, a lot about water source selectivity, and then toward the end about ion-ion selectivity. So let's talk about the first one, and this will be the, again, water permeability. So, and I'm starting it with a question, can high permeability membranes improve energy efficiency? Because the initial research that I mentioned in the early, I mean, 2006 and around 2010, a lot of papers were done by this unique material that can provide very high water flux. And they claim that this will 
be a quantum leap in desalination that really with this high flux membrane, we can have desalination with almost no energy. Some of them, again, the news media, I mean, uh, change it in a way that almost no energy. And we are talking about carbon nanotubes. We know that carbon nanotubes are, again, they are uh, can have narrow uh, diameter. They are uh, atomically smooth, hydrophobic, and the water can go very, very fast through these carbon nanotubes because there is almost no friction. We can talk about aquaporin. This is the uh, water uh, protein channels that we have in, 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 in all cells. And they can also transport water at relatively high rate. And more recently, uh, graphene, if you have just a, a, a one monoatomic graphene sheet, I mean, you can have in principle, very thin membrane that, that provide very little resistance. And if you have the right holes here, you can get high permeability membrane. So, however, and again, there are plenty of papers, again, all these high impact journals that many of us, I mean, hope to publish and so on. And we did some analysis again, way back. And again, this is a, a new, I mean, graph that's showing it in a different way. We did an analysis for the full scale reverse osmosis plant. When you have the, really the membranes, not as a small coupon in the laboratory, but more as a module. And here we describe the energy consumption in kilowatt hour per cubic meter. And this is the water permeability of the membranes. And we did the analysis for different seas, very uh, highly saline sea like the Arabian Sea, typical seawater and also brackish water. If you go to seawater desalination, the current permeability is in this range between two, I mean, around, around two LMH per bar. These are the units that, of the permeability. And for brackish water, reverse osmosis, the permeability is here. Now, this next generation membrane with very high permeability should be somewhere here. I would say anything above 30 and it can be much higher. And as you see that once you pass a certain water permeability, the energy consumption doesn't uh, drop, I mean, because really in this case, what control the energy consumption is the osmotic pressure of the brine, exit brine, rather than the membrane resistance. So even if you have membrane with zero resistance, you still need a lot of energy because of the osmotic pressure of the brine. So, and again, again, I started from point three, but those of you who know the history of reverse osmosis, the first membrane was cellulose acetate. And for the cellulose acetate, the permeability was less than point three, was all the way here. And this is why the energy consumption for the cellulose acetate was high. And why by having the thin film composite polyamide membrane, we reach the point that really we almost the optimal energy in terms of energy consumption. So again, we recently we wrote an article and, and we call it the universal insignificance of novel materials for uh, further enhancing the energy efficiency. We analyze, and again, I'm focusing in here only on the energy efficiency. Materials will and may have some other applications, but when it comes to the energy efficiency, Thermodynamics, like what I mentioned, this brine osmotic pressure really control the energy consumption and we apply to thermal technologies, sort of like a solar thermal desalination and a membrane desalination, electrochemical a, a desalination like CDI and again, reverse osmosis. And we find that materials will not change the energy consumption a lot, maybe just a few percent. So this was just about the first part of the talk about water permeability and again, it's already well established and accepted now that high permeability membranes will not improve the energy efficiency of desalination. And I would like now to move to the second topic, which will be more extensive with some more uh, fundamental and, uh, research and talk about water salt selectivity. So there is a critical, again, we publish again a, a paper with this a diagram that's showing again, the critical need for high water salt selectivity rather than high water permeability. And again, in the membrane science, we typically present a selectivity of membranes as a selectivity, which will be water salt selectivity, how much water you passed better than salt. We need high selectivity. And this is the water permeability and roughly experimental data or membranes fall roughly in this range that you see more like a trade-off. If you want high water permeability, Sorry, if you want to have high selectivity, you will drop the water permeability. And what I showed you from the first part, just what I finished, uh, an earlier topic, 
that if you just improve the uh, water permeability, there will be minimal impact on energy efficiency. And what we think there are much more room and uh, more benefits for increasing the water salt selectivity. And again, when you're going in this direction, it means higher salt rejection while keeping uh, adequate water permeability. And why it's important, I will give you some example. Let's take for seawater desalination. Boron is a ubiquitous component in seawater, uh, in seawater and it's in the form of uh, acid and membranes do not remove small molecules which are not uh, in ionic form. So this boron can go relatively easy. You can get only maybe 70%, 75% rejection by the seawater RO. And then there are some applications, for example, in Israel, all the desalinated water is eventually used for irrigation. And they need to uh, reduce the levels of boron because boron, many, many uh, crops are very sensitive to boron. Indeed, the regulation for in agriculture for boron are even lower than the one for human consumption. And if we have really a membrane with high uh, rejection, we will reject the boron very effectively because nowadays, because we do not reject the boron effectively, we have additional reverse osmosis passes after the main pass, another one, two, and sometimes three, just to reduce the boron to meet the regulations for agriculture. Let's go to wastewater reuse. I showed you that reverse osmosis can also use for wastewater reuse. And when you have small molecules like disinfection byproducts, for example, NDMA, some other uh, Wastewaters can have a, a dioxin, again, if you have industrial contamination, and this will also go relatively easy through the membrane. So if we have membrane with high rejection, we can really have anything by one pass. Another example, ultra pure water production. This is a huge business. And nowadays, the way we do ultra pure water production, we have reverse osmosis, but then because we did not remove all the salts, we go through ion exchange and sometimes electrodeionization and many things. So imagine, if we have a reverse osmosis membrane that have 99.999% rejection, then we can have deionization just by one step. So, so this led me to some, uh, again, next generation highly selective membranes. And again, we analyze potential membranes that can be highly selective. And I would like now to focus on just uh, aquaporine and some other synthetic channels and see what are the challenges if you really incorporate them into a membrane if they can really provide high water salt selectivity. So I'm presenting now the work of uh, my former PhD student, Jay Werber, who is now finishing a postdoc at University of Minnesota in chemistry, and will start a faculty position at University of Toronto next year. So the envisioned biomimetic membranes are that you will have these channels, can be, again, any of these that I mentioned here, aquaporin or synthetic channels and you will incorporate them into some kind of amphiphilic uh, bilayer, either lipid, again, lipid will be not practical from engineering application, but you can think about amphiphilic black copolymer, and they can be assembled here the same way that uh, aquaporin is assembled in the lipid bilayer in cells. And this is what we call a biomimetic membrane. So we had a quick, uh, quick question. If we were able to do it, and if we have defect free, which is very challenging, what will be the performance of such membranes? Will they really be the best membranes? And this is what I'm going to show you now. So first we analyze the, uh, again, we said, okay, we know the permeability of all of these channels, carbon nanotube sporing, aquaporin, and synthetic channels. We know it from the literature. And we said, let's incorporate them into a membrane theoretically. And we wanted to know what's the aerial coverage because these are highly permeable. What area of the membrane should be covered so we can get the permeability that we know that is good for reverse osmosis and there is no need to work at higher permeability between two and three LMH per bar. And we see that it varies for carbon nanotubes because they're very permeable. We need less than 1% of the area covered which means 99% of the area will be just this black copolymer bilayer. Synthetic channels are less permeable, but here we need 8%, which still means that 92% of the area will be the bio, the 
lipid bilayer or the black hole polymer bilayer. So we see that the most of the area will be not the aquaporin or the synthetic channels, but rather the other metrics. So we need now to say, okay, what will be the performance of such membranes? Because if most of the area is this black hole polymer bilayer, it may control the performance of this membrane. And the way we do it, again, it's very common in this field. Again, it was, uh, again, in the biophysical literature and adapted to our, again, uh, aquaporin and desalination membrane literature. You can create vesicles with this, uh, again, uh, channels incorporated here. And then you can study the permeability of solute and water for these vesicles. And once you determine the permeability of water and solute, you can say, okay, suppose I'm able to make them as a planar membranes, what will be the performance of these membranes? So this is really the question for this part of the presentation. So we decided not to do lipid bilayer because again, they are not robust for engineered applications. So we took a black copolymer bilayers and uh, the first one we had the PBPO, again, you will have hydrophobic and hydrophilic uh, head. We, again, schematically, you show here that we anticipate that they will self-assemble like amphiphilic polymers. Uh, uh, and, and we indeed, uh, when we uh, did this, form these vesicles and did cryo TN, you see that we can form a vesicle about 100 nanometer in size, which a thickness, I mean, less than 10 nanometer for, for this, the polymer that we have used here. So this is one of them that you were able to do. We also were able to do it with tri-block of polymer. Again, if you have a tri-block, again, you will have hydrophobic and hydrophilic ends. And we anticipated, again, based on literature, we know that such a, you know, amphiphilic a molecule will self-assemble. And indeed, we were able to create these vesicles. So now that we were able to create these vesicles, we develop a technique. And again, I will not again show you the detail here, but in principle, we adopted a technique from the uh, biophysical uh, literature in which you incorporate some fluorescence inside the vesicle. And this fluorescence will quench as the function of concentration. So in principle, if you have the fluorescence and water enters and dilute it, it will quench and you will see a change of the fluorescence that you can translate to the volume and then calculate the permeability. And the same thing with solutes. Some solutes we, we've seen, if they will change the pH or some other indicators, uh, we can find uh, you know, the permeation rate of the solutes. Those of you who are interested, you can see it in this literature here, our paper. And we did a bunch of experiments with uh, water, of course, and many uh, organic molecules that have different properties, uh, diols, polyols, carboxylic acid, and others, and we wanted to see, and again, we determined the permeability through these vesicles, and we wanted to correlate the permeability to some properties. First, we tried to correlate to the size of these organic molecules, and we did not see any correlation. The permeability was not related to the size as we expect from just transport phenomena. On the other hand, when we correlated the permeability to the octanol water partitioning coefficient, which tell you how polar or how likely the molecule to partition into an oily phase. And again, so, so the larger the KOW, the more it can partition into this oily phase. And you see that we found a beautiful correlation. Again, permeability to log KOW, again, you go here and the hydrophobicity increases for the two uh, vesicles, the tri-block and the di-block copolymer. So we've seen that permeability through the black of polymer is solubility dependent. The molecule solubilize partition into this uh, bilayer and then diffuse it through the bilayer. And it's well known when you have lipid bilayer, it's not well known from the biophysical literature. You can go to some old papers from 30 years ago and they show it. But here we show it also for the black of polymer, synthetic polymers. And also we see that this uh, PBPO is less permeable. So again, for this species, which may be good as you'll see later. So now we can quantify the permeability. And, and again, we also measure it for, uh, again, uh, also for sodium chloride and water, I did not show it to you here. And with this data, 
again, we say, okay, let's will be, what will be the accept, expected permeability when you deal with seawater? So if we put the synthetic channel in seawater and in seawater, we need to remove salt and boron, and these are relatively hydrophilic. So this was our, our uh, estimation and uh, based on these measurements. This is the water salt perm selectivity. The higher the value, the more the rejection. You want to get high rejection. And this is the water permeability. This is the data for commercial membranes. We took it from different uh, uh, TFC modules and from the companies and literature. And this is what you expect. If you have about 5% aquaporin Z, which was the optimal to get the right permeability, you see that we can get water source selectivity many, many orders of magnitude more than the current membranes. It means for sodium chloride, and you will get much higher uh, water source selectivity. And this corresponds to 99.5 times 9, 99.999% rejection because this salt will not go through this black of polymer because it's hydrophilic. And the channels, if they are not effective, will remove all this salt. And the same thing we did for the boron. For the boron, again, boron is uncharged, so it can go through, we did some measurement, can go to some degree through this black of polymer by layer. But let's take the best uh, polymer, the PB here. This is the current, again, this is the water boron permeability perp selectivity, the rejection goes in this direction. This is the water permeability of the membrane. This is the current membranes. And as you see, the boron will be again, not many orders of magnitude, but at least two to three orders of magnitude more. So it means the rejection will go from 75 to about 98%, which also will need that means that you will not need additional passes for reverse osmosis. So all in all for a uh, seawater desalination, they work well. But let's go and see what's the application for uh, wastewater. And here there are quite surprises. So let's hear, I collected, we coll sorry, we collected literature from different organic molecules, from all industrial uh, disinfection byproducts, pharmaceuticals, personal care products, all these things that you see in the literature, and some of them will be end up even in your uh, tap water. And we, we presented it as molecular weight versus KOW. And again, as you see, all of them are hydrophobic. It's a positive KOW, except some that when you go here, NDMA and dioxin are relatively hydrophilic. Now let's go and before going to the next generation membrane, let's go and talk about the current polyamide membrane, TFC RO membrane. We did experiment with this solute that I mentioned earlier, and we measured the rejection over the molecular weight. And not surprisingly, anything above roughly 100 gram per mole molecular weight, you get almost complete rejection. And anything less than 100 gram per liter, we know that it relatively can go through the membrane, especially if they are not charged. So, okay, so this is the area of low salt rejection. And let's project it here. The area of high rejection, high molecular weight over 100, 100, you see most of the organic contaminants, so not bad for them, except the NDMA and 1,4-dioxin that I mentioned that we have problem to remove them. They're very, very small. So this is the current membranes. But again, we want really to focus on these small molecules because we know pharmaceuticals, personal care products are quite large and they will not go through here. Now let's go to our, uh, you know, aquaporin-based membrane or biomimetic membrane. And this is the PDPO, the dye block with 3% aquaporin. And these are the measured perm selectivity of water over the solid selectivity. Again, rejection goes in this direction versus the KOW. And let's see here. This is the area, anything that is hydrophilic or negative minus low KO, negative low KOW, we know that it will be rejected quite well because it's hydrophilic. And anything that hydrophobic will not be rejected well, as you see based on this data, rejection less than 50%. And when you project it here, we have a real trouble because this area, all these organic contaminants, although they are large, but they're hydrophobic and they will go through this membrane because 97% of the membrane 
is this blackopolymer and these molecules partition into this blackopolymer and dis uh, dissolve and then diffuse through it. And only we will only remove uh, better uh, well this hydrophilic compound. So the dramatic conclusion here that if you create such a membrane, although they are good for seawater desalination, they will not be good for wastewater because in wastewater, all the contaminants or most of them are hydrophobic and they will easily go through this membrane. Now, I would like now to, uh, it's here time, okay. So I would like now to uh, say a few more words about it. And again, we do a lot of research and again, in the laboratory with these, you know, aquaporin, uh, we can get very little, you know, some salt rejection. And the target is really to get synthetic membranes and high salt rejection and no defects. But we have a really, really problem, as I say in the title, scaling up is a downing challenge. So there has been research on a biomimetic membranes for desalination over one decade. And although we can show their a good performance in vesicle format, and this is the way we measure them, any attempt to have a planar membrane, even a size of one centimeter square fail, you cannot get high rejection because you cannot create such a thing. It's a lot of defects. So my conclusion, if we fail to move from vesicle to very, very small area, one centimeter square, probably to scale it to industrial scale of 100 square meter would be really, really a daunting challenge. So it's really, really challenging. And I think, I think it's a difficult way. And toward the end, I will show you more thoughts about it. So it's nice for research. It's a beautiful uh, fundamental research and uh, a nice concept, but a lot of difficulties to upscale. So I'd like to continue with this topic and talk about a graphene. Again, I mentioned some uh, highly selective membrane can be synthetic or biological channels, but let's talk about graphene. There are a lot of, again, many of you that follow the literature, there are a lot of studies on graphene and specifically on two dimensional uh, materials. Again, mostly graphene, but you can also have molybdenum disulfide. And again, they propose such membrane for desalination for a, in such a way that I'm going to describe. And there are plenty of papers. Again, people are excited. Any new materials, immediately people looking for some applications. Again, this is the work of my PhD students, uh, Cody Ritt. And there are plenty of papers. This is on graphene, again, oxide in all these fancy journals, and also on molybdenum disulfide and some other uh, two-dimensional materials. And they envision such membranes to work as, as follow. You will, uh, again, a process that you vacuum filter these uh, nano sheets and they will deposit nicely, again, ideally. And in principle, you will have only the water molecules going through all these tortuous paths. And the salt, because it's very big, if you create the spacing the right way, they will not go through. And we were quite puzzled because we have seen all this literature and, 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 and so it doesn't make sense how you, and again, people that were not able to report very high rejection, but I say, it doesn't make sense how you can create such an ideally with no defects and, and have it as a membrane. So we said, okay, let's study it by a, a, a Monte Carlo simulation. We try to simulate the way you make these membranes. And the way you make these membranes, again, I told you, you take some graphene nano sheets, as you see here, you disperse them in water and then you vacuum filter them. And when you vacuum filter them, you will form these layers. And we try to simulate this process by, we call it randomized sequential deposition of these squares. And again, you create these layers one after the other and you create a membrane. And two important parameters in this membrane. First is the pecking aerial density. Aerial density describes what fraction of the surface will be covered by the uh, nano sheets that you see here. And as you see, just from, uh, if, you know, from uh, this process, it's difficult to get, if you have anything the same size, you will never be able to get more than 54% coverage without overlap. And we avoid overlap because once you overlap, you know, you will get all this tilting and it will affect all the performance of the membrane. And we simulated this process and then creating membranes and then challenge it with a sodium, which is, this is the hydrated ion and water molecules. And then we were able to, 
do like experiment and get what the salt rejection and water permeability. And I would like to summarize the data. It's again, it's a very loaded graph and I will guide you step by step. This describe a graphs of the perm selectivity or water salt selectivity. Just think about it. We can translate it to salt rejection is here. So think about salt rejection. And this is the water permeability coefficient. And I'm showing you the data for different aerial coverage. Let's take 50% aerial coverage. By the way, we use nano sheets of different size so we can get very high coverage, like 90%. And let's take an experiment, 50% coverage and you create such membrane. So you start somewhere here. And as you create the membrane, it becomes thicker and you get the water is more difficult to go through the membrane. So the permeability de de decreases because the water needs to go through all these membrane more tortuous path. And we stopped when the permeability reached one LMH bar because anything less than one is not e efficient. You will need more energy. And with such a membrane, we were not able to get more than 10% rejection, which many laboratory experiments show it. Then we say, let's have 75% uh, coverage which is the best experiment they were able to get 75% coverage. And we start building the layer. And as you build, the water permeability decreases because it's thicker and thicker. And at the same time, the rejection increases until we stop about here, less than one LMH bar because it's, the permeability is very low. And here we got about 94% or, or, or I think 80% rejection, it's, it's a long scale. And again, the best performance that ever reported for such membranes, if they did the experiment correct, is about you know, 70%. And we said, let's take the hypothetical case that you have 90% coverage, which is very difficult. Again, we have coverage with no overlap because once you have overlap, you will, the members will not be, uh, the nano sheets will not be uniform and we want to keep them uniform so you will have the right spacing. And I did not mention it here, but we have the spacing here we designed the spacing so to be 0.5 nanometer, which is very challenging. And again, we assume that all the spacing of all these nano seeds that deposited there will be 0.5 nanometer, which again, probably it's a dream. But even with this one, again, we can, again, as you have 90% coverage, we get more and more rejection and we stop at about one. Again, if you go to very, very low permeability, you can get 99% rejection. Now, when you go to the current TFC polyamide membrane, they fall here. This is the current membranes. So you see that even with 90% coverage, that is almost impossible. And even under an ideal condition that everything is laid down very uniformly, you will not be able to beat this polyamide reverse osmosis membrane. And, and this is because of what we call framework defects. Again, you can think about it when you have one layer, again, you form the one layer, and then you form another layer above them, and you will have all these framework defect interconnected. And you really need, eventually, you need to build a very, very, very thick membrane to avoid this framework defect, the interconnect like the framework defect, but then you reach permeability, which is very, very low, and then it's not useful for desalination. Okay, so this was about uh, this membrane. I would like now to go over the last part. Oh, I think I need to a little hairy. So let's talk about reverse osmosis, again, the ion-ion selectivity. We know that reverse osmosis and nanofiltration are not very selective. Again, if you look at the rejection versus, again, reverse osmosis, they can reject monovalent and divalent salt relatively well. Nanofiltration can have some selectivity between monovalent and divalent. But here we are looking at something even more complicated. What will be the selectivity between monovalent? If I have lithium and sodium, I want to separate between them. And the reason because the mechanisms are not uh, straightforward. I mean, are, are, again, this membrane works on either size exclusion or charge. And this is not enough to get the right selectivity. It's, you need something more sophisticated. And this one, we rely again on the biological channel. The potassium channel, which was developed again over a evolution of, I don't know, one billion year or whatever the, the time, uh, many, many hundreds millions of years, can really, this is an amazing channel. It can pass 1,000 or 10,000 potassium ions and, for, and only one sodium ion will go through. You can get selectivity of 10 to the four of potassium over sodium. And how does it do it? It's really amazing. 
So I will have another slide to describe it, but in principle, we know that when ions come to a narrow channel, they dehydrate, they shed, they shed the water molecules. And the potassium channel is designed for the potassium in such a way, again, 1 billion year of evolution. It has the right size. And once the potassium dehydrate, again, once you dehydrate, you feel your energy is high, you feel nervous. You want to immediately find something to bind to because you don't like it without the water molecules. So you have some functional groups here that the potassium binds. And now the potassium compensates for this uh, dehydration. It feels, oh, it feels good. Now I compensate it because I, I feel that I bound. And the sodium cannot do it. The sodium is smaller and it will just go here by diffusion. And because of this binding to these sites and jumping between these sites, you can get much higher transport rate of potassium. And again, these are the principles. If we want to design a good membrane that can be selective between ions that are almost the same, they need to have the right size. So when you dehydrate, you still can go through. We don't want it too small that when you dehydrate, you cannot go through. We need to have binding site that will compensate for the, uh, pen the energetic penalty when you dehydrate. So the, the, molecule, the ion will feel stable. You need to have a thin layer. If it's very, very thick, the transport rate of the potassium will be very low. But it's very, very, if it's very, very, very thin, also the sodium will go through. So you need to have the right uh, you know, thickness. And the potassium channel also have this unique thing that you have spacing of these functional groups in such a way that we have what we call the knock out, knock down effect. This positively charged potassium pushes this one, which pushes this one and they move through the channel. And I would like to show you some uh, experiments that we have done. Again, we will never be able to do anything like this, but just to illustrate this uh, selective transport through some uh, experiment to show how we, we just created a, a membrane and we wanted to show selectivity between magnesium and copper that practically they're about the same size. They are the same size and how we can make them selective. So we use the same principles of the potassium channel. We created a membrane with diamino uh, acetate functional groups. And it's well known that uh, sorry, uh, copper can bind very strongly. The log K, the stability, log stability constant is about 10 and magnesium will not bind to it. So we hoped that once, and again, we adopted the literature from the group of uh, Bruning from Notre Dame, uh, some of the techniques here. And, and we said it will bind here and move like the potassium channel. We did a diffusion cell. We put both the magnesium and copper here and measure the diffusion across a membrane in a diffusion cell. This is the membrane with the diamino acetate. And indeed, we were able to reproduce the idea of the potassium channel. You see the uh, permeate concentration we get high flux of copper because copper can bind to these groups and then hop and jump the way of the potassium channel. And magnesium, the uh, binding constant, the log stability is about two compared to 10, doesn't have this ability, so it doesn't go through the membrane very effectively. So we're able to achieve selectivity of 63 and we extended it to different metals and we were able to really show a lot of interesting things. Now I'd like to go over about a few more slides and again, showing the uh, additional uh, selectivity between ions for uh, different membranes. I'll show you some ion exchange membranes. And I will just tell you that generally it's common in this literature to describe the transport by the energy barrier for transport. So in this example, we have a example of red ions so they will have high energy barrier, so they will not cross the membrane. You see no red here. And if the energy barrier is low, like the blue ions, they can go through the membrane. And there are many reasons why you get this energy barrier. You can have steric effect, too small, electrostatic, dielectric, and all described in a perspective article that I mentioned. And we say, let's apply it to an ion exchange membrane. So this is an ion exchange membrane. We can measure a, a different salt, sodium nitrate, sodium fluoride, sodium bromide, sodium chloride. We can measure the flux through the membrane at different temperature. We can apply the Arrhenius type equation that you know from chemistry. And based on the slope of the flux, 
versus one over the temperature, as you know from uh, basic chemistry that if you remember, from this slope, we can calculate the energy barrier. And I would like to show you some data. This is the energy barrier for transport for the fluoride, chloride, bromide, and nitrate. All of them is a sodium salt through an uh, anion exchange membrane. And we see that the energy barrier for fluoride is the highest. And why it's the highest? Because it has the highest hydration energy. Fluoride has the smallest, smallest ionic radius, so you need more energy to take the more water molecules out. So it's very difficult to dehydrate compared to the bromide. Let's not talk about the nitrate because nitrate is not a spherical, it's a different shape and the shape play a very important role and I will not talk about it. So we see that we can have this energy barrier correlate to the hydration energy. And we also measure this pre-exponential factor. This pre-exponential factor can tell you if you have in principle no energy barrier, so zero. So this will be just a flux with no energy barrier. And we see the same trend. And the reason again, it's this interaction. Fluoride has the highest hydration energy. So it doesn't dehydrate well. And because it doesn't dehydrate well, it doesn't interact well with the uh, functional groups on the anion exchange membrane, the uh, positively charged group. And this is the reason why it moves faster. So again, I don't, I don't want to go through again. I think the key is really to show you this gr graph here that illustrated here, but we do a lot of other studies to try to understand what control the selectivity of different ions and how to quantify them. And this is just an example how to present them as energy barrier. So the last, in summary, I have a few more slides to summarize. We went through this evolution of these uh, next generation membranes. The main practical conclusions, again, if they are engineers or, or industrial people, for the first part, for water permeability, we do not need ultra high permeable membrane. Two to three LMH per bar would be good because we also know that to work at high flux, it's impossible. You get fouling, concentration polarization, and, and, and we don't want to work at high flux. Water salt selectivity to get very high salt rejection, the major challenge would be defects. And I gave you this example of the aquaporin and the graphene and, and, and the molybdenum disulfate. And ion-ion selectivity, it's a new area. And I think, in my opinion, we need to mimic some biological channels. And I gave you the example of the best selective, you know, biological channel of the best membrane that you can find, the potassium channel. So, so again, I will skip this part. I think it's not, uh, not important here. Now we'll go to the last slide. So we went through all these next generation membrane. And as I said in the title in the beginning, the TFC polyamide RO membrane are still the gold, are, are the gold standards. I think they are they're still the gold standards and we're likely to be for many years because we are far away for getting any other membrane with even close to this rejection. In my opinion, if we really need some uh, any uh, membrane, we cannot use the approaches that I showed you earlier, which are top-down approaches. We need to use bottom-up approaches, molecular design, that you have some molecules that interact and you create the structures and the pore that you want, as opposed to all the other membranes that you already take existing structures like GEO, MOF, MOS2, etc. And you hope that by putting them in such a way that they will arrange perfectly with no defect, it will not work. You need bottom-up approach. So to conclude, I'd like to thank many of the funding agency and my group. This is my group with undergrads way back and now my size is about half of it, which is good. I have more time to breathe. So thank you so much and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Manny. That was a terrific presentation. We covered a lot of ground and we have a lot of questions. So I just want to acknowledge we'll probably uh, run a little past four o'clock um, and that is okay because it's a great, great set of questions teed up. So uh, I think the first relates to this question of uh, bottom-up molecular design and what else you could apply it to. So for example, um, you know, PFAS contamination is a major issue. Are there ways that you could use some of these same design principles you've laid out here to create a membrane that could actually, you know, selectively separate 
PFAS or PFOAs or other um, you know, emerging contaminants from complex aqueous solutions? Yeah, the, it's a good question. It's again, it's a hundred million dollar question probably. So, yeah. but again, it's a, I, I showed you have selectivity between quite challenging separations like a, a potassium and sodium. I think for PFAS, I mean, it will be difficult to do a, a, have a membrane that's separated by size. So you need to have a combination of size and also chemical affinity. If you can derive and have some membrane that have some chemical affinity the same way that, let's see if I can get out from here. If you have chemical affinity of, of PFAS, uh, let's say uh, PFOA, uh, and then it will jump from all the sides of this membrane. And then you can, you know, you can either, uh, you know, pass it uh, more effectively or block it. So, so it's very challenging. I think, uh, in my opinion, for PFAS, probably rather than thinking about membrane separation, you may need to think about uh, ultra fast selective, you know, removal degradation. So this would be much more effective, in my opinion, than separation, because there are so many PFAS, so many sizes, and mm -hmm. so on. So I don't think you can use membranes maybe to concentrate them and then mm -hmm. go to some other you know, degra degradation reaction that you just selectively target them. So let's talk about energy because as you've pointed out, the energy use of desalination and reverse os osmosis processes is one of the biggest constraints on going to scale. It creates a lot of cost and waste. So um, the question is, membranes are prized for energy efficiency and the pumps that drive that process can be powered by renewable sources. But phase change processes like thermal distillation require more energy, but you might be able to use solar power to drive those processes. So the question is really, is there some way to do uh, an apples to apples comparison between these two different uh, processes to figure out which one has a better impact on overall energy consumption and sort of sustainability? Okay, it's another interesting question. So in my opinion, again, strong opinion that uh, again, thermal desalination uh, Again, it's, it's completely inefficient for thermodynamics and probably it's not the way to go. If you have solar energy, the best way to harvest it, create electricity and then operate reverse osmosis. Mm -hmm. Unless you have some very, very high salinity that cannot be, again, when you go to very high salinity, you cannot remove, you cannot use reverse osmosis because the osmotic pressure is very high and you need very, very high pressure. But anything that reverse osmosis can do, use the sun, energy produce electricity and operate it. So, and again, thermal desalination, people will say we can use low grade heat. There is nothing like this. There are not plenty of low grade heat as you think. It's very difficult to achieve it. And if the temperature is very low, you will need a huge plant, the heat exchanger. So, so all in all, I'm completely not in favor in thermal, uh, any thermal separation It's just uh, completely inefficient. Mm -hmm. Quite a number of questions about um, scale up in the manufacturing process as part of this. Um, so first, uh, scaling up the aquaporin membrane is a challenge. What happens with fouling? Do they foul more readily than TFC? Yeah. It's, ah, oh, boy, you, you have such a good question. So, so again, the first case is to create this aquaporin or synthetic membrane with no defect so you can get this high rejection. And I indicated all the challenges. But now, once you create it, then you have all the other problems. You have the problems of fouling and scaling. And the current polyamide is very easy. The companies, they just have some little coating, polyvinyl alcohol coating to make them more fouling resistant. So once we create this next generation membrane, we need to think next how to make them fouling resistant, which will be a challenge. For example, you have carbon nanotubes, probably a lot of things will be attracted to the carbon nanotubes. So we need to address it after you create such a membrane. Mm -hmm. Follow up to that, um, the disconnect between membranes that are being researched in the lab and the membranes that we use in practice, either in industrial application or in uh, utilities, what new manufacturing techniques might we need to enable scale up of some of the novel membranes that you're, you've talked about here? Uh, okay, so anyway, the current membranes are not bad there, by the way. I mean, they, at least they, again, my talk on desalination polymer are not bad, but again, researchers, we always try to find to make it better. And even if you make it better by 5%, you know, 5%, it's a lot of money if you have desalination capacity of such and such. I think the challenges of all these uh, next generation membrane in upscaling are the defects. It's just because they're very thin, it's, it's impossible to avoid these defects and mostly because it's a top-down approach. If you were able to take the molecules and react them and create a membrane, and indeed this is the way we do the 
the interfacial polymerization. It's more like a molecular level bottom-up approach. But if you can have something that is more sophisticated, then, then it will be good. So I think the upscaling of the next generation, the defects are the main things. So, and it's very, very challenging. And again, you can reduce the cost, you can do all the things, I'm sure you can do it, you know, eventually carbon nanotube and synthetic channels can be very cheap, but to get the defects, because no defect would be very challenging. Yeah, so specific defect question related to your Monte Carlo modeling. Um, were the individual nano sheets treated as rigid in the plane because um, many of the 2D materials are mechanically flexible, so they would bend to close small defects, but do you have a sense for how big that effect would be? Yeah, I mean, I, in our case, we assume that everything ideal, that they deposit horizontally and that they deposit in such a way that the spacing between them is 0.5 nanometer and so on. All the other things like they're not, they're not, they're not, uh, they're flexible, so the spacing will not be 0.5. They will be landing in it, uh, not horizontally, they will be tilted. So we took the best case scenario that probably impossible to generate. So all these challenges will add more complication that will make it even worse. Good news. So I'm sorry there, to be realistic. Yeah, yeah. Are there other are there manufacturing methods um, that you can think of that would be interesting to consider here when we're thinking about how to achieve performance at scales that we would need for water applications? So you're thinking about uh, manufacturing for what kind of membranes? Yes. Um, let's see. I think just generally, I, I mean, you may have covered this question um, when you talked about the novel membranes, um, but I think there's generally a lot of question about the translation from sort of research to manufacturing and industrial use. So if you've covered- okay, for, the, for the current membrane, the polymeric membrane, we have all the technique, you know, the phase inversion, interfacial polarization that are perfected and so on. Mm -hmm. All the other technique for the next generation, you need to find something similar like roll to roll, you know, in manufacturing. And, and there are some research that show that you can do, I mean, small scale. And again, once you do small scales, I mean, you, you can upscale it. So, so, so I think the challenge is not to find the technique to upscale them. The challenge is to upscale them without defects. Mm -hmm. This is very, very challenging. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, so one question just came in um, about your thoughts on TFN membranes produced by companies where they have nanoparticles in the membranes. Can these nanoparticles be made selective and used for the third concept of membrane design, the ion-ion selectivity? So this thin film, uh, fil thin film nanocomposite, it's, it's not true. There was a company that formed that they sold it like they would put nanoparticles there and, and the process failed. And the company eventually created regular polyamide. So anything, I mean, people already realize if you have this mixed matrix membrane, when you create polymer and nanomaterials, you have uh, grain boundaries and you have a lot of defects. So I wish that someone will get this membrane from nano, from I think they sold it to LG and analyze it. It cannot yep. work with nanoparticles. It's a simple polyamide membrane. And LG bought the company because they wanted to expand to this field. They wanted a polyamide. So all attempts to have mixed matrix membrane or TFN failed. And I don't think it's the right approach because it's still top down. So I want to close with a question um, about scale and the scale of this problem and the scale of the market. 4.5 billion people, you said, are affected by the water scarcity problem. That's a big potential market, but it's also, it's not a very, you know, centralized market. And so is there, is there funding um, that is coming in to support work on this? Like, where do you see sort of the future in terms of needs for resources to, you know, continue to investigate this line of research and going to scale and deployment in the field to solve this problem for people? Again, I discuss only seawater desalination and, and wastewater reuse. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I would expect it at this stage to be uh, applicable only to developed countries. I think most of the problem that you're talking about are more in developing countries like Sub-Saharan Africa, part of India, even some parts of China and so on. And I think the challenges there are, are, are different. You know, uh, I, again, they, if you have any water source, even the contaminant, we have the technologies to treat and, and, and transform the water to any quality. The question if, if it can be, the cost would be affordable by the, the, the people there. Or if you go to rural area, like in sub-Saharan Africa, I mean, 
how they will adopt it. I mean, uh, will it be sustainable? Because in the past, some organization from the West came, built all these water, small water plants in the Sub-Saharan Africa. On the left, the people went and just cannibalized the plant, took all the metal parts and so on. So there, I think the issue in this, and again, it's a continuum when you talk about developing countries, but the very, very underdeveloped like Sub-Saharan Africa, the issue is not technology. The issue is more social, cultural, education, you know, corruption of it, so on. So, so I, I think we have the technologies, just need to write, to find the right technology to the right place. Matching, right, to the right, to the right place. And, well, and the right, uh, you know, financially, you know. That's a good challenge to end on. Uh, so thank you everyone for all of our collaborators for pulling this together. Uh, thank you many for joining us. This was thank really you, my pleasure. And I really, the questions were really, really very good. So it's good. Well, thrilled to have you. I'm gonna share my screen one more time, uh, just to flag for everyone, this is the Third Coast Water Seminar is a recurring seminar series. We are meeting monthly, and I hope everyone will be able to join us on December 2nd, where we'll be hearing from Megan Motter at Stanford University, uh, talking about technologies to enable energy efficient water reuse. So a nice build from this discussion today. So thank you everyone for joining us. As always, this will be recorded. You can revisit this link. Um, we'll be sending it out to all the participants and hope you enjoyed. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.